I'm Dr. Susan Corso, and we're here tonight to talk about apologies, but apologies that we haven't gotten, not apologies that we have. Um, I know I certainly have been in the position to offer an apology and not wanted to do it, and not offered an apology when I should have, true professions. Um, but I also have very recently been in a situation where I really wanted an apology and I didn't get one and I haven't gotten one. This was an event about an event that happened um, a little over a year ago. Someone who was uh, living in my house decided to take a very serious COVID-19 risk with my life and didn't tell me. And, and then lied about it. And then it came out in conversation. Like it was something that we all knew was so. Um, I still haven't gotten an apology, just so you know. <laughs> However, I have been doing the practice that I am going to teach you tonight for that year. And it's a whole lot better. And if I actually walked into her at a store, I could probably say hello now. And a year ago, I probably would have slapped her, which is not exactly um, the most spiritual approach to things, but it really was how I felt. So I know about apologies that I haven't received, and almost everybody, I think, does. That's not unusual. So I'm going to invite you to think about this apology that you haven't received from whomever you haven't received it or whatever, because it can just as easily be a government, a job, right? As it is an actual person, an ex, um, a kid, uh, you know, make the list, right? And that is this, what if the apology that you haven't received is actually a gift? I'll say it again, just so you have some time to think about it, right? What if the apology you haven't received is actually a gift? So think about the last interaction you had with whatever this is that you want the apology from. Was it fun? Was it a good conversation? Well, most often not. Think about the one before that. Think about the one before that. Often, those interactions are fraught, they are painful, you get into it, it's a problem, right? So here, if, if you didn't receive an apology and you feel like you should have received an apology, clearly, what is that about and why? And how could that be a gift? Well, you don't have to get into it with them again, right? So that's a good thing. And you get to deal with this apology on your own terms. Right? This is an apology that, for whatever reason, you didn't get. You wanted and you didn't get. And that's really the only important fact. Now I know there's probably all kinds of feelings around it. There's probably all kinds of worry around it or doubt or anger or blame or guilt or, sh I mean, I'll make a list, right? Fear. It's the whole thing emotionally. But what if you were spared something by not having to have this conversation? What if it was a grace? What if... This is a way to make it easier for you rather than harder. Because I know in my situation with this person who risked my life, there's not really a chance that I would ever have a real conversation with her, right? Someone who could risk my life and not tell me, really, really? How could anyone do that to another person? Make that choice for another person, right? So, okay. So if this is a gift, 
what we're actually looking at is forgiveness. And before you roll your eyes and go, oh God, I can't, right? Never. Hang on. Because forgiveness is not what most people think it is. And the only reason I have my light on here is so that I can read you a list of 10 things that forgiveness isn't. All right, let's start with what it's not. Forgiveness does not mean that you condone whatever happened. Forgiveness is not really hard. Forgiving other people isn't hard. There are really three levels to forgiveness in any kind of forgiveness practice. The first one is forgiving other people, and that's usually the walk in the park. But the second one is forgiving yourself, and that can be a whole lot harder. And the third one, if you are a person of faith, is forgiving God for letting it happen. Oh, that, right? So one out of three isn't hard, but two and three are really hard sometimes because it doesn't make sense, right? Forgiving doesn't mean forgetting. Ever, ever, ever. Forgiving never means forgetting. What forgiving means is remembering and working through the pain so it doesn't have to hurt you anymore. That's a whole different job, isn't it? Forgiveness is actually remembering, not forgetting. I think people fell in love with the alliteration of forgive and forget, and they forgot that, well, wait, that's not what real forgiveness is, right? There are people who have trouble with the word God. I only use it because it's the shortest one, truly. Forgiving really doesn't have anything to do with God. It has to do with your will. You can include God in it if you want. There are people who do. I do, but not required. Forgiving myself is impossible. Really? There's a kind of mean judgment in there. Is it there? Like, wait a second. It's one thing to have done something bad, right? And you blame yourself for doing something bad. All of us do. That's, that's human nature. But um, blaming yourself isn't the same thing as shaming yourself. Blaming yourself is disapproving of something that you did. But shaming yourself is disapproving of something that you are. And there is not a one of you that has any reason for shame at all. Ever. Forgiving means I have to forgive for everything. Ah, uh, no. No, you can forgive someone for borrowing a blouse and having them ruin it, but not for, oh, I don't know, smacking you upside the head. Let's call it that, right? No, you don't have to forgive everything all at once. It's not like a toggle switch. It's more like a rheostat, you know, like the dining room lights. <laughs> it's, a, it's a spectrum forgiveness. It's not either or. Forgiving means for keeps is one of the other ones. No, no, no. No, forgiving means for now. For now. And if something comes up in the process of your forgiveness that makes you feel unforgiveness again, okay. That's part of it. That's absolutely part of it. it I think forgiveness is a... Um, you know, advance, retreat, advance, retreat, advance, retreat. You know, two steps forward, five steps back some days, right? Some days I'm so mad at the young woman who did what she did to me that I can't even say her name. We call her, my husband and I call her she who in our house. But really, like, whoa, other times I'm fine. So it's a process. It's not this instant thing, right? Forgiving means that I'm good and they're bad. Oh, no, 
no, forgiveness doesn't mean that. When I read that to my husband this afternoon, he said, uh, oh, you mean revenge forgiveness. <laughs> Which made me laugh, right? Forgiveness with a knife that you twist while you're doing it. No, wait a minute. Wait a minute. No, no, no. Forgiving means the other person will change. Mm, probably not. Probably not. If the other person had changed, you probably would have gotten the apology. If the other person wanted to change, you probably would have gotten the apology. Now, this is not to say that you instantly diss the possibility that that person can change. Everybody wakes up ultimately, right? Maybe not as fast as you want or I want, but there will come a time when this person who hurt me will come back to me and say, whatever, right? Some public encounter, but I don't need her to change for me to be okay, right? And the last one is forgiveness means I lose and they win. Mm. <laughs> it, it, it can feel that way. It really can feel that way. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that way, right? And that's a pretty, um, I don't know, binary way to look at it, right? Why is it winning and losing? Why isn't everybody losing if there's an unforgiveness? Right, because here's the real point about forgiveness more than anything else. It's one of the most supremely selfish acts we can ever do, but selfish in the best possible way. Selfish because it is an act of self-care. It is supreme self-care, forgiving hurt. You know, when someone hurts me, I have 50% of the responsibility, right? They have 50% of the responsibility. Well, but when I'm the only one who's hurting, I'm holding 100% of the responsibility. Why is that okay? Why is that ever okay? It's not. It's a shared thing that happened between us, right? So it should be both our responsibilities. But if one person has abdicated, or as sometimes happens in situations like this, where the person that you really want the apology from is no longer on the planet, no longer living. How do you get that apology, right? Well, you don't inform, but you little by little learn to care for yourself. And caring for yourself means that you actually do the forgiveness, not for the other person. That's why it's easy to forgive other people, right? You can clean up your own side of the street anytime. Forgiving other people is not the hard part. But what I also know is that if we don't care for ourselves, and forgive when there's a raw place in ourselves, who gets hurt? Because the other person has moved on, right? They're done. And I'm, ow, what the hell? Sorry, but really it is hell to be stuck with all the hurt that's left behind. I'm seeing nodding heads. So this is, this is not unfamiliar to people, right? So, okay. I have been um, a spiritual director and a mentor and counselor for almost 40 years, um, which means, of course, that I started when I was five. Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, uh, and... As a result, I have been working with the human energy system for a long, 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 long time. And one of the easiest ways to, to work with your own energy system is through um, uh, an Eastern medicine uh, 
organizational system called the chakra system. Do you know what the chakras are? Yeah, yeah, everybody? Okay, so you know that there are centers of energy in the body and the major chakras are seven. They start at the bottom of your spine, they go to the top of your head, right? And they correspond to the colors of the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Well, when I started doing this work with people, um, someone told me once upon a time that I had been a color healer in Egypt. And I looked at her and went, oh, right, sure, whatever. Um, and a friend of mine took me to a spiritual bookstore, East West Books in the city on 14th Street um, uh, that night. It was my birthday. It was my 25th birthday. And um, I was standing in front of a, a shelf of books on color healing, and they started to fall off the bookshelf on my head. And I... I, I um, I turned to my friend, whose name also was Susan, and I said, Susan, do you see that? She said, yeah, they're, the books are falling on your head. You might want to pick them up. So I picked the ones up that had fallen on the floor, and I bought them, right? I went home, and I started to read about chakras. And all of a sudden, I realized, wow, wow, I know this. I don't know how I know this, but I know this. I get it, right? So I have been using the chakra system really since I started counseling people. And it's amazing to me how it works for two reasons. One is that like the electricity in your house, right? You have switches on the walls that turn the lights on and off. But what they also do is they break a circuit or they complete a circuit. And that's what makes lights go off and on, right? Pretty simple electrical. I mean, that's the entirety of my electric, electrical engineering career right there, but I do know what a rheostat is. So, okay. So the chakra system is similar to the electricity in your house. Namely, it works within itself. And the thing that has struck me for years and years about the teaching on the chakras is that nobody really teaches it as I understand it from my own work with it. And that is that what's important about chakras isn't that they exist. What's important about chakras is how they relate to each other. Right? It's like um, you can have middle C on a piano, right? Well, if you want a chord, you need two other notes. And it's the relationship between those notes that makes the music, right? You know, music is about the pauses between the notes and the relationships between the notes. And chakras are the same. They're centers of energy in your body that actually power your body. And as I've come to learn, each chakra comes with a gift. And it's a gift that everybody has. Right. And because you have this gift, you are you offer something out of the richness of yourself. So I'm going to focus tonight on the heart chakra, which is your personal heart right at the bottom of your sternum, right behind the bottom of your sternum, you know, your breastbone. Right. And here's here's my high tech um, handout. Right. This is the color of the heart chakra. <laughs> origami paper. Right. This is the color of the heart chakra emerald green right brilliant it's like it's like grass and leprechauns all together that green right shiny shimmery green okay so as i have studied over the years and i've read a lot about chakras of course um i discovered about 15 years ago that there's an eighth chakra that very few people talk about that was originally noticed by the Kabbalistic rabbis in Spain in the 1870s. And the eighth chakra is in front of your thymus gland. Now your thymus gland is right 
in the middle of your sternum, like between your chin and the bottom of your actual heart, right? Right in front of your sternum. And it's about eight inches out in front of your, here I'm making gestures and you can't see me. No help here, right? So it's about here, right? Out in front of you, okay? And the color of the eighth chakra is this. Brilliant rose pink. Bright, 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 rosy pink. Oh, <laughs> that was your handout. <laughs> so bottom line, the relationship between these two particular chakras have to do with an exchange of gifts that will change everything when it comes to the apology that you didn't get. So let's talk about the heart chakra. The gift of the heart chakra, the, your personal heart chakra is love. Everyone has a capacity to love. Now it's different for different pe people. Some people love animals better than they love, they love people. Some people love kids better than they love grownups. You know, it just depends what your calling is, right? I raised three little brothers. I decided in this life that I was not going to raise any more children, right? That's what comes with growing up in an alcoholic family. So bottom line, what your heart chakra allows you to offer to the world, anyone in the world, is connection, right? So you have the gift of love, the grace of love, and because you have love, you could offer connection. Now that connection can be as simple as holding the door open for the mom with the stroller and three kids at the mall, right? Like that simple, or it can be a hug, or it can be with a friend, or it can be with a lover, or it can be with, you know, people you sit in the pew with at church, right? All different kinds of connections come from connection, right? And what has happened in your unforgiveness is actually disconnection, right? In the apology you didn't get, it disconnected you from your own sense of love in whatever that situation was. And as I say, it doesn't have to be, you know, deeply emotional or personal. So your heart chakra makes you able to say hello to your neighbor, makes you able to recognize faces on Zoom. You know, this is a connection. It's an energetic connection. And I come to that from my own personal heart. But the eighth chakra in front of your thymus gland, which is absolutely fascinating as far as I'm concerned, is really your compassionate heart. It's the heart that has impersonal love. It's the heart that can recognize another hurting human being. It's the heart that is actually, actually able to offer kindness, meaning the recognition of the same kind, right? It, but it's, it's regard, it's not personal. It's, ah, oh, yes, that's a human. Like it, don't like it, have an opinion about it, have a feeling about it, like its hair color, it doesn't matter. Right? Oh, I see. There is another person. Right? That's all that is. And as the rabbis began to work with this chakra, they called it <clears throat> da'ah, which can, in Hebrew, it can mean wisdom, um, but it can also mean compassion. So this eighth chakra, this pink chakra, is, is rosy pink. And uh, uh, my experience of it is that it's like sitting inside the uh, like a pink diamond. So you're looking at refracted light coming, uh, but you're at the center of it, right? So you're inside this crystal cave, if you will, of brilliant, beautiful light that's blessing, but that isn't coming from you. You are surrounded by it impersonal love. And it is the connection between your 
fourth chakra, meaning your heart chakra, and the eighth chakra that allows you to do the work of apology that you don't receive, basically. So I want to get make sure that everybody gets a felt sense of what this, it's like having a pink ball of light right in front of your body. And it's so interesting to me because the thymus gland is the gland that's in charge of your immune system, right? Just think if what had approached the thing that, that hurt you, right, for which you want the apology, if you were immune to the hurt about it, because you met that with your compassionate heart, not your personal heart. It's your personal heart that's hurt. Does that make sense to you? It's your personal heart. Well, but it's not your job ever as a human being to carry personal hurt. Not ever, never, never. Not It never meant for long term. Sure, everybody learns, right, from our mistakes. Um, when um, I was married to my first husband, um, we'd had a, a, a child die between us um, on the day he was born and it completely changed my life and I was smack dab in the middle of the grieving and in the middle of that my husband's brother was killed and to this day now I talked to my ex-husband today we're friends but to this day I wish I had reacted better to helping him through the pain of losing his brother so I have regret about that, but I'm not still agonized. I asked his forgiveness. I told him what I thought I did wrong. I was really specific. He said, yeah, you're right. You were, you were caught in your own stuff. That happens. And he's right. That does happen. That does happen. So all that by way of, if you can imagine this, pink ball of light, but in front of you, in front of your eighth chakra, where, where your thymus gland is, and feel a ball of warmth, of connection, but also in person, impersonal. There's not a lot of emotion. There's not a lot of feelings. There's not a lot of any of that. There's just, huh, this happened. This happened. Oh. And let yourself have the sense that you actually have this gift of compassion. That when you see, let's say, a homeless person, of course you feel compassionate. When you see children who are hungry, you know, in the news, of course you feel compassionate. When a friend hurts themselves, you know, and you have to take them to the emergency room, of course you feel compassionate. You don't even think twice about it. We just don't often think to apply compassion in our personal experiences. Compassion seems to be relegated to the people we don't know, right? Because we're supposed to be passionate about the people we know. We're supposed to be caring and connected to. And connection and compassion aren't really put together in our brains not personal connection and compassion, right? So feel this ball of energy in front of you because it's always there. It doesn't go away. It can't be hurt because it's part of your natural wiring, just like the wiring in the walls of your house are, right? The, the, those, those wires are there. You don't go and check to make sure the wires are there, right? You just turn the light switch on and on it goes. So here we go. You are in a situation where you want an apology and you didn't get one. Okay. Okay. If you can get in touch with those feelings and not get all emotional and upset. You can, but forgiveness isn't about feelings. 
I know that's surprising, isn't it? We're supposed to feel better when we've forgiven someone. Yeah, no. Forgiveness actually is about your will. You will to forgive someone. It's a choice. And it's not a choice you have to make. This is not some holiness test, right? You don't have to forgive until you're damn good and ready. And I say that quite deliberately because most of us tend to forgive too early and to keep the pain close to us so we don't have to be ashamed of it, so we don't have to air our grievances, so we don't have to put our dirty laundry out in the world, right? We, we hold that pain close to us so that, so that we never can let it go. So here is an energetic exercise. And it's exercise just like a jumping jack that you can use to begin a forgiveness process, not only in your mind with your will, but also in your energy system so you don't have to carry unforgiveness in your body. Gather up all the hurt that you feel in your personal heart. Like there, it's just so many dust bunnies of hurt. And I mean dust bunnies of hurt because we make dust bunnies much more monstrous than they really are, right? Just gather up the hurt in your personal heart. And I don't care, use a wheelbarrow, use uh, uh, an earth mover, use whatever you, uh, you know, a spoon on the beach, whatever works, and put it in your eighth chakra. Put the hurt from your personal heart into your compassionate heart. Gently. You may not get all the dust bunnies on the first round. You know how they are. They like to multiply. Just let an impersonal, compassionate regard hold your hurt so you don't have to hold it for one more minute by yourself. And it should feel a little bit lighter. The thing about this is that once you take this first layer of hurt off, you might find other hurt. You might find like weird, stupid memories coming up of a time you maybe had a good time with a person, right? But that makes the hurt worse. Put them all in your compassionate Take all the hurt wherever you keep it in your body. And all of us keep hurt in our bodies. The thing about bodies that's so amazing is that they don't lie. And they don't lie because they can't lie. Bodies always tell the truth. So, okay, wherever you have hurt, put it in your compassionate heart. And remember that this is an act of self-care. This is real self-care. So you don't, you know, not that, not that taking a bubble bath is not self-care, dear ones, of course it is, but a bubble bath doesn't heal you. It temporarily soothes you, right? I'm looking for real life, genuine, 100% healing and the best way to do that is to use your own energy system to help you. So, for example, I had a dream about the person who did to me what she did. Uh, last night, in fact, I woke up in the middle of the night and my third eye, where I imagine dreams live, right, was pulsing. It hurt so bad. It's like, ah, oh, I just want to be asleep. Come on, I have to teach tomorrow. I have this, I have that. Blah, 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 blah. What did I do? I took it from here, I put it in my compassionate heart. 
compassionate heart, wherever you're keeping hurt. I have found for myself that it works with pain as well. I broke my foot uh, doing my 10,000 steps. Clearly there was one step too many for me. <laughs> right? I didn't fall. I broke my foot walking, right? <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> but I took the pain from that and I put it in my compassionate heart. The idea that there is an energetic immunity available to you at all times can be hugely transformative. You don't have to hold on to anything that's not yours. I know people who listen to the news and then put their reactions in their compassionate heart. Right? They just can't take the polarization and the politics and the crazy and then this and this. Okay, okay, okay. Right? Whatever causes you pain. And it doesn't matter. Right? So let's say you're doing your compassionate heart work, right? And all of a sudden you have a memory from high school about somebody who, actually, this happened to me, not high school, fifth grade, San Vaccaro snapped my bra strap more times than I care to tell you because he sat behind me in the fifth grade. <laughs> okay. I had to forgive San Vaccaro. So I will be 64 on my next birthday. Fifth grade was a while ago. Right? I have no idea why that showed up, but it did. Right? Any time. I am presented with pain, I say to myself, okay, do I want to keep this? Do I want to keep this? I can. But the other thing about forgiveness is this. It's, as I said to you, it's a process. It's a reestat. You're going to think one day you're going to do this. You're going to go, whoa, I don't have any more dust bunnies. This is totally cool. And then you're going to go and have lunch in a restaurant where you had a meal with that person. And suddenly you are going to want to weep sitting in your car in the parking lot. Okay. Humans are like that. I can't begin to tell you how memory is layered like that. But you always have a completely free, dependent only upon yourself, exercise that you can do every single time, right? So I don't care. Do it when you see walk, don't walk signs in New York City. Do it when you're at red lights. Do it when you're waiting in line. Do it when you're on hold. Do it when, while you're exercising. I mean, there's a, you know, every time there's a television commercial, right? Set up a trigger for yourself so that you practice it and it becomes an instinct because that's what you're looking for. You're looking to be able to identify, ah, I'm hurt. Something hurts. It's not even necessarily I'm hurt. Something hurts. Okay. I need to transmute that. And this is what the rabbis discovered about that chakra is that that chakra, the eighth chakra right here, and I've worked with it now for 25 years, more than any other thing, its purpose is transmutation. It is meant to change how you are experiencing something personal into something bigger, into something, if you will, I mean, this is, so, this is so lofty, but, you know, cosmic, right? Human beings don't do very well when we don't understand the meaning for our pain, right? And a lot of times we think we know what's actually causing pain, and we don't. I realized that in my situation that it was the lie that bothered me more than the risk, right? Fine, risk my health. Tell me the truth about it. Yikes. Like, this is a person who's supposed to be a friend. That doesn't make any sense to me. My friends don't lie to me. Even if they're not, you know, saying something that makes them happy. Right? They tell me the truth. So, this is, this is one way to work with pain, with unforgiveness, with 
anything that you want changed in your life, anything. It's amazing. It changed. I have seen it change people's relationships with their bosses. I have seen it change people's relationships with their in-laws. <laughs> I have seen it change people's actual relationships where they think they're about to, you know, be divorced and all of a sudden things are different. We are not generally taught how to let things go. We're taught how to hold on. Right? And human beings really have two things that we do, right? We avoid pain and we go toward pleasure. Well, that makes sense. I mean, th that doesn't require a rocket scientist. <laughs> but we get them convoluted sometimes, right? We think that if there's pain, we deserve it. Or we think if there's pain, there's something that we're supposed to do about it. Wait a minute. What if you're not capable at all of handling it? Right? What if it feels so big that you can't even get your arms around it? That's why I use dust bunnies, the dust bunnies of pain, right? You want the wisps. You want the little itty bitty things that can wear you out when it's the middle of the night and you wake up and your third eye is going nya, 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 at you, right? So part of what I do with the clients that I work with is I teach them how to manage their own energy system. And none of us are taught this. The chakra system is one way to divide it, right? You can also do it in terms of different, um, you know, the circulatory system, the muscular system, musculoskeletal, blah, blah. You can do it that way, right? It doesn't really matter. These are the ones that work for me. Now, the other thing that I sometimes do is that I believe that humans are fourfold beings, body, heart, mind, spirit in that order right that is the order of density of energy body heart mind spirit so body moves at the speed of earth heart moves at the speed of water mind moves at the speed of air and spirit moves at the speed of fire so this chakra is about fire. It's about changing the nature of things and changing them quickly. Don't be surprised if it takes time to work through old or long held hurt. It will. It will. I grew up in an alcoholic household and it took me a lot of years to clean that up with my mom and her four husbands. A lot of years. But I did because I kept at it. I kept thinking, I don't need to carry this. I am not responsible for every glass of scotch that was poured in that house. I'm really not, right? So part of this, part of the task here is to figure out what part of the responsibility is yours, but not forgiving, not doing any work, but holding pain to yourself is very, very hard on you long-term, very hard. Cause that's really what causes old and long and chronic illness is unfinished feelings a lot of the time. Now I'm not saying that, you know, if you're mad all the time, you're gonna get this. I'm not, I'm not uh, equating it quite as directly as that. But long-term, when you carry long-term hurt, it's going to show up in your body eventually. It doesn't start there. It starts in your, in your spirit and in your mind and in your heart. But eventually, when it gets too heavy, it moves into your body. And I've been a medical intuitive since I was a kid. So I have some experience of this, right? So I'm happy to answer any questions. And then we will do one more process. Um, I, uh, David Renata, the engineer, yay, good guy, we need him, um, said, uh, raise your Zoom hands. I don't know what that means. <laughs> he said, if you have a question, um, I'll, I'll answer it. So Court has a Zoom hand up, I think. Am I right? Correct. Yes, the Zoom hand is under the reactions. 
And it's a way for people to be able to electronically let you know that they have questions. And there's some questions that are already, I think, in the, the chat. My, my question is a, is a quick one. You described the speed of fire, which is so poetic and beautiful, but I don't know that I understand what that means. Could you explain? Yes. You just imagine watching fire and how quickly fire changes whatever it touches, right? Think about it. When earth touches something, right? Like an avalanche, let's say, boom, it falls and then the weight changes something. But fire changes the actual cellular nature of something like that, right? You put the you put the wood in the in the flame and pretty soon you need more wood, right? So it's the fastest way to make changes. That's why when people uh, do spiritual work, the way to, to work on yourself is in your own integrity, right? What, that's what you want. You want your own sense of wholeness. That's what I mean when I say integrity. I'm not talking about, um, I'm not talking about a uh, mo morality superhero. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about your own inherent wholeness. Which is why when something bad happens, when something scary happens, the thing to do is engage with it, right? You don't walk away from it. You go, oh, when this happened to me, I was in New York City. I lived in New York City at the time of 9-11, right? Yeah, it was a really big deal and a whole lot happened at 9-11, right? That was transformation by fire. Everything that touched changed. It fell to pieces. So if something that you're carrying has gotten harder and heavier inside yourself, putting it in fire will either melt it or change its nature in, in enough of a way that it softens. And then you can move it out of your personal energy system. Does that make sense to you, Fort? It does. Yes. Thank you. And cool. it helped a lot to understand that. It sounds, it sounds, someone said, it sounds good, but how exactly do you do that? Do what? Who's asking that? Deborah McKeever? Hi. 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 Um, you, you were saying take the, the hurt from the compassion, from, from your personal heart into the eighth chakra. So do you just think about that hurt and just, wish it there and what i would do is i would get a broom and a dustpan metaphorically in my hand i would go into my own heart i would scoop up all the dust and i would move it and dump it seriously i mean mm. do actual visual things you know how somebody people say you know you, you, you change your mind right so when i when i tell people to change their mind i make them get up and stand somewhere different mm -hmm. when you need to change your mind you move because that's what you're looking for is motion. But here is it, it's motion in emotion, right? Instead of that stuckness of, oh, if only, or we could have, or maybe if I'd worn a different color dress, maybe you know, like all that stuff, gather it all up. And I don't care if you need a dump truck. I don't care if you need a crew, <laughs> get a crew, seriously, hire a team to get it out because you deserve to live in joy, for real. I know bad things happen. God knows, you've heard me tell like three stories in my life, right? In, in less than an hour. And there's been a lot of stuff, how we say, in my life. Well, okay. It's one of the reasons I became a spiritual teacher. I had to get a handle on it. I had to figure out how to live and still be okay. Right? Isn't that what we all want? Is that to feel happy about waking up in the morning? That'd be good. <laughs> and okay. well deserved. Well deserved. Never doubt for a minute, no matter what you did or didn't, that you don't deserve to live in joy. You do. You all do. Mm. I wouldn't lie to you. I'd be stricken down in a minute. <laughs> Thank you. My sincere pleasure.
We have shy Zoom hands here. All right, let's do it one more time together. If you have to hire a crew, fine, hire a crew. They can appear instantly, right? Angels, whoever you want to help you, right? Go into your personal heart. That beautiful emerald green, which is grass and leprechauns all together. And look around. And if there's any shadowy places, any places where you're carrying hurt or a need for apology that you just didn't get and don't think you're going to get, well, okay. Gather them all up. Every single bit. Don't you carry it by yourself for one more minute. And when you have it gathered and able to be moved, you take that and you put it in that brilliant rose pink ball of transmutational light and lighten your own personal heart. And let that light, let that pink diamond work on what ever hurt you've been holding for yourself or for the world and let it soften and be changed so that you can actively say inside your own personal heart, I forgive X or Y. I forgive my friend for risking my life. Just be in appreciation of the magic of your own system. Your own energy is completely capable of doing this, of doing it repeatedly. You will never run out of an ability to transmute pain for yourself. It is infinite. And because you have that kind of compassion for yourself. You may congratulate yourself on extraordinary self-care. Self-care that lasts a lifetime and that helps to make you immune to more hurt that would pile upon old hurt if you weren't able to let it. I want you to breathe in joy and breathe out anything that isn't serving you right now. And again, joy and letting go of anything that doesn't help you. And again, one more time, joy and release. And when you're ready, open your eyes. I see different faces than I saw to begin with. There are some smiles. Isn't that nice? Someone has asked how you can reach me. My uh, website is I, the letter I, ampersand, A-M-P-E-R-S-A-N-D dot O-R-G. I ampersand dot O-R-G. I also have a personal website, susancorso.com, and that is for my writing. Um, I'm a novelist, and I write uh, novels about an investigator who solves her cases by listening to an intuitive voice in her head that she calls spirit. Um, there are 10 of those and they're all uh, on Amazon. So um, the other thing I would tell you is this. Uh, in a couple of weeks, no, in 12 days, I'm teaching a class called uh, Where Do We Go From Here? And it's about healing betrayal due to COVID-19. It's a writing workshop. It's four weeks. You can learn about that on uh, iampersand.org. Um, I will tell you a little bit about ampersand just so you understand why it's called that. Um, my One of my favorite questions to people is, do you ampersand? 
And what that means is, do you live a life based on and as opposed to a life based on or? We have come to the end of or in our world, I believe at this point, right? You or me doesn't win anymore. We all have to take care of each other at this point. We don't have any choices anymore because the planet is gonna kick us off if we don't take care of each other. So I'm asking, do you ampersand? Do you live in an inclusive way, right? Do you live with and? Or do you live with or? Well, if I get that, then you don't get this. Well, honestly, you know, I got over teams when I was in the fourth grade and I'm still over it. I want one team. So that's why it's called I ampersand. And um, I occasionally, so you know, will work privately with people. Um, I work very short term, no, usually no more than um, 12 weeks. And we deal with a particular issue particular problem. Um, and it's my joy to do that uh, uh, around the writing that I do. Um, and we are almost out of time. So thank you so very, very much for being here with me. Uh, uh, Susan, uh, Susan Margaret has a question, has her hand raised. Oh, my apologies, Margaret. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I was Okay, my question is this. I am angry at humans for the way we are treating the earth. It's very painful to me. Um, I understand. And of course, I don't expect an apology, right? But I, I, I would like humans to change. Anyway, so I guess I wasn't sure exactly how to deal with that in, in your way. I mean, I'm thinking I can put my pain into that big, big, big pink ball. I guess that's what you're saying, right? You can, and you can take the actions that you can where you are to help humans understand, right? Yeah. right? Right, which I'm pretty sure you're already doing. Right. Right, but we get impatient with ourselves, right? Like, why can't I change all of humanity? Yeah, uh, honey, it's a big job, you know, <laughs> like, yikes. Part of my commitment to, on earth is uh, to work for peace, right? And, and when I used to give corporate speeches, I would, people would say to me, yeah, but that's a big job, you know? I go, yeah, so everybody assigned it to Mother Teresa, but then Mother Teresa died. So now what are we gonna do, right? Well, bottom line, right? You're right. It would be really, really good, Margaret, if humans got it, totally good. And a lot of us don't wanna get it, right? That's what's so hard for me anyway. So I would write humanity, the word humanity on an index card in my mind and I would move the index card. Mm. You can't, you can't, I mean, you can't, you can't, what are you gonna do? You can't put all the faces and the name, you know, 7 billion people, man, you'd be tired, right? And I can understand, I can understand the anger at, uh, at, the, at the way people have so cavalierly handled the planet. But then you take the actions that you can where you are, right? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. And you know, if you get a better idea, send me an email, susan at susancorso.com for real, because I'll share it, truly. I mean, I think, I think that that in as much as we like to think that we want to make big changes and it'd be awesome to make big changes, sometimes, you know, Mother Teresa used to say, peace begins with a smile, right? You don't know if you open the mall door with that mom and the diaper bag and the three kids in the stroller and she's like ready to cry because she just wants to buy her sneakers and she can't get the damn door open, right? You may have made her day. Right? You have no idea how far your kindness goes. So you be kind to the earth and you show people how to do it. Mm -hmm. And please, God, if you're a God person, please, God, let us all get it and learn to take care of this place because it's pretty amazing. 
I'm sitting here and three deer just walked across my lawn. And before that, two bunnies were hopping. I guess they were doing their mating thing. They <laughs> hopped to each other. It was so cute. I've never seen it. <laughs> Very sweet. Very sweet. So that says something about your energy right there. <laughs> right? Welcoming. That's all we can do is make a difference where we are. It'd be awesome if, you know, I could make a wish go around the world, but I don't know what's going on all the way around the world, right? But I do know what's going on with the guy next door and the one over there. And I talk to them. So, okay. You blessed me very much. Thank you for being here. If I can be of service to anybody, please, I ampersand.org, please be in touch. And Thank you very much. A blessing to David Renata. Thank you. Thank you.